okay so you can see support protection movement because without bonds you don't move anything okay you need muscles and nerves everything to move something or to do what you are trying to do uh, electrolyte balance acid base balance uh, blood formation all of these are functions of the bone tissue and I mentioned earlier whenever you say osseous, osteo, it relates to the bone tissue. So you can see osseous tissue and the process of bone formation. There are specific names but at this point in general you call calcification or mineralization because you build those minerals into building blocks for your bone tissue, right? But there are specific names later on the process of uh, how there are two different ways this can happen. And the bones that you find, you have different kinds. I may have mentioned the last time itself, some are flat bones, some are irregular shaped bones, some are small bones or long bones. So you need to be able to figure the difference and place some examples, okay, which bones will be considered long bones, like most of the <coughs> bones in your arm, leg, right, the long ones. And then you have the... Uh, flat bones, bones of your skull, uh, scapula, <coughs> then you have the irregular shaped bones, your oscox, uh, the vertebral bones, they all have uh, irregular shape, okay. Short bones, your uh, carpal bones, for example, tarsal bones. Then if you look at figure 7-1, we saw that in the video you see the long bone, a typical long bone with the compact bone on the outside and the spongy bone on the inside with the ma marrow cavity in the middle where you have the blood vessels and the nerves and the ends of the bone we call epiphysis and the middle portion is the diaphysis. Spongy bone has another name they also call cancellous bone. Periosteum, endoosteum. Periosteum is the layer that you see when you look at any bone from the outside. Endoosteum is the layer you don't see, but if you have the cavity in the middle, whatever is facing that cavity, the innermost layer, they call endoosteum. Endo means inside. Travis, if you want, you can go home and take a nap. Okay? You seem to be restless. You are distracting us and me. Turn over to page 210, figure 7-3. What's your, what's your name? Uh, you can see how you uh, have the osteocyte and the osteoclast form uh, from something you call either stem cell or osteogenic cell. So, you, once they get the signals, your genes are turned on for that cell, they produce certain proteins that activate other factors inside. See, all this we remember, we talked about the first messenger, second messenger in the beginning, right? All that uh, is involved in these cells getting the signals and then you need certain proteins that uh, activate something else and so on. Uh, so you start differentiating from one cell into the other cell. So you become either osteoblast or you become osteoclast. And uh, once the job is done by the osteoblast, they become mature cells. We call them osteocytes. So um, I have a um, question. So our bone marrow is basically, it's, it's liquid form. Mm -hmm. So that's how they're able to retract it to use it for med um, And if you look under the matrix, you can see the minerals that are uh, found in your bone tissue. Calcium, phosphorus. They are found in the form of either calcium phosphate or hydroxyapatite. In compact bone, the structures we already saw, the osteon, the big Compact bone is made up of structural and functional units called the osteons, the big circles with the lamellae inside and the osteocytes, the canaliculi, uh, the 
osteocytes are located in the lacuna, the space around, then you have the canals, the central canal and the perforating canal. So you can see them on figure 7, 4. Spongy bone has the sponge-like appearance and the structures that give them a sponge-like appearance. If you see the word is highlighted, some are small, some are larger, they call them spicules and trabaculae that give them that spongy appearance. And uh, inside the caps you will find bone marrow as well. The bone marrow is in the cavity as well as it gets into the spaces in the sponge, meaning the spongy bone. Then uh, within bone marrow you can see the red and uh, yellow bone marrow. So red bone marrow is what is going to produce your blood cells. So they also call it hemopoietic tissue because it's going to produce your blood yellow bone marrow can revert or go back to red bone marrow as and when needed depending on age. Uh, figure 7, 6 shows where you normally find the uh, bone marrow. So easy way to remember here, the, co the color coded regions. Where do you find most of the red color? Think about it. Axial. Exactly, the axial skeleton. So you know what the axial skeleton is made of, right? All those bones plus appendicular skeleton, but not everywhere in the hip and the bones on your arm and the thigh, the head of those bones, the head of the femur and head of the humerus. So, actual skeleton, the hip and the heads of those two bones. There are two ways the bones form. We call it intramembranous ossification. And you can see the figure 7-7 seven, seven that goes with that description. What you see there is you see some blood vessels. In step 1 you see a few osteoblasts coming around like you saw in the video. And then they start calcifying that matrix with the calcium and phosphorus they can get. And then you see the layers slowly being built around and finally you see the bone tissue in step 4. This is intramembranous ossification, just starting to build around something. Here the something is your blood vessels. But the second one they call endochondral ossification. In this case, uh, in some uh, bones, the first you have, uh, when you are born, before the bones really form, you have some cartilage tissue that is replaced and then you have the bone tissue formation with the osteoblast. Like on your coxy, coxies, how that, if they're not fused, but then they become fused? No, this is more like when from a newborn to an adult, when you start forming the bones, mostly you have the endochondral. But after that also, the bones keep growing all the time, okay. up to a certain age. So. Um, so at that time, you, you just have to make some more, some more tissue, then you just build around whatever is there. Okay. So if you see endochondral ossification, uh, you can see it's a process in which the bone is preceded by a hyaline cartilage model that becomes replaced by the osseous tissue. So how this happens, let's take a look. And most of the long bones, you can see how they form in figure 7, 9. Step 1, what do we see? You see what they call cartilage tissue. It's one of the three kinds. We have the hyaline, elastic and fibro. This is the hyaline type cartilage. And then you see those dots represent in step 2 ossification center. This is where your osteoblasts are going to become more active. And then what is happening? You have uh, osteoclasts making the cavity there. Okay, Vascular invasion, you get uh, blood vessels coming in. And then you can see in step 4, you can see uh, another cavity forming on the top. This cavity is much more wider than before. And then you see a region where you see the epiphyseal plate. The epiphyseal plate uh, is where the 
bone keeps elong elongating. Like first the bone gets wider and then it gets longer. Then finally you see the shape of the bone. The same picture you saw earlier with the epiphysis and all that, right? So this you can see the uh, line where the active growing region was there. They call it the epiphyseal line. So epiphyseal plate when it's actively expanding epiphyseal line is the scar that is left behind once the bone is finished. In figure 7, 12, you can see the different stages starting from 1 through 5, zone of reserve cartilage, cell proliferation, uh, cell hypertrophy. Hypertrophy means the cells swell and they explode which ones? The cartilage cells and then they are replaced by the bone cells. Uh, step 4 is calcification and then bone deposition. Towards the end of the chapter, they discuss about how the calcium homeostasis works and how these two different groups of cells, your osteoblasts and osteocytes are activated. So under the physiology, you can see the words mineral deposition and resorption. Deposition is the formation process. The resorption is the breakdown process when you start uh, dissolving the bone tissue, they call it resorption. When you start forming the bone tissue, they call it deposition. So you need to know which one is what and who is doing what. So the deposition is done by which group of cells? The two we saw. <coughs> osteoblasts. And the resorption is done by the osteoclasts. Then under calcium homeostasis, you see the words hypo and hypercalcemia <coughs> that uh, relates to whether you have excess or you are short on calcium. Hypo means less, hyper means more. But we need a few compounds that are involved in this calcium homeostasis. Calcitriol, calcitonin, parathyroid hormone. So you can see them on pages 222 and 223 and you can use the figure 7, 14 and 15 to understand this. So calcitriol is derived from vitamin D. Okay, so you, you, you have three organs involved, more than that four organs. Okay, you absorb the calcium from your intestine, right, from what you consume. What else we need? Vitamin D that comes from your skin. And then you have the liver and kidney. So the vitamin D, the liver processes and makes it as calcitriol. And then the kidney is involved in forming the calcitriol. And that's how the calcitriol comes into picture. Okay. And then how these work, if you see in figure 715, you can see the calcitriol uh, affecting couple of processes and the PTH which stands for parathyroid hormone. So if you see from the digestive tract you absorb the calcium into the blood cells and then it's deposited. So calcitriol helps with that. Okay. And then uh, the PTH is involved when you do the resorption in addition. So you can see figure 716 that shows you how the correction is done. If you have excess calcium or if you are low on calcium. So in the first uh, part A, you can see correction for hypercalcemia. So if you have excess uh, calcium, the calcitonin is released. It reduces the osteo 
class activity because you have more calcium, right? So you need to put it away somewhere where in the bone. So the osteoclast activity has to be reduced and it triggers, increases the osteoblast activity. So you put the bone, the calcium in the bone tissue, okay? And so your blood calcium comes to normal. The same way, the other one is the opposite. If you have deficiency, then the PTH is a hormone that induces the osteoclast activity primarily and that releases the calcium into the bloodstream. And towards the end, they have discussed the different types of uh, bone disorders and fractures that we saw earlier, how the bone fracture is fixed. I want to look through that. And in the end, they discussed the osteoporosis. For the osteoporosis, just read through that, but you know what the condition is, but I don't want all that detail from that last page. Try to know the different fractures and uh, if you want to watch the videos again, you can go back, you know, where they are. And uh, the beginning of the term, I sent you some excellent links. I don't know, some of you may be using, some of you may not. I don't know why. And the veterinarian diamond lecture is a very excellent source for those of you who need uh, some more help outside class.